on boats and daisy chains can't seem to recall my true given name welcome to the social-engineer.org podcast number 56 number 56 yes folks <laughs> there it is the long lost and missing dave that- hey Hey, hey. Michelle tried. I missed, I missed you guys. For the last I couple of months, Michelle tried to be the day fill-in. I don't have the base. Dolly, she's been like silently stalking everybody in the background when we were talking before the podcast. Yeah, I'm a lurker. Yeah. Michelle's my, my resident ninja. <laughs> That's what <laughs> well, I do. hear from you. You know, she just stays in the background and slices people up and yeah, kills them. Yeah, when I yeah. give her the, the the look, then she just comes up behind you and that's it. You're it's over. <laughs> That's how I play. <laughs> So, and then you have Jordan, who schmoozes the women uh, around, and including Michelle, so that you don't get ninja. <laughs> it's, it's a good balance. See, the thing is, if you try to schmooze Michelle, I think she would ninja you just for the sake of trying. Yeah, ninjas yeah. don't make exceptions, man. It's Jordan. Like, I understand for, like, everybody else in the world, but, like, if, it, if I was a girl and I was Jordan, I'd probably do the same thing. I'd be like, hey, I'm not going to be a ninja right now. Does he have, like, a certificate or, like, a license that he shows <laughs> keeps him from being ninja because I need, I need to see that, actually. The anti-ninja license. That's yeah. a, that, we, we just turned ninja into a verb. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Ninja's supposed to be a noun, and we turned it into a verb. Epic start to the podcast. Thanks, Dave. It's good to have you back. No we problem. missed you. I missed you all, too. It's been it's been too long, and I apologize for missing the last couple. I think I missed two podcasts. I was on the other one when Ping wasn't on, or she came in late. So I do still hold that record, because I, I beat her on that one. <laughs> And she's not here again today for, for Matter of the Facts. So this is the second podcast that I've been on that she's missed. So thank you. That is true. That is true. Yeah, it is. <laughs> Dave, actually, you're the only person that when they're not around, I get emails about where you are. I swear, one day I'm just not going to come to a podcast. I'm just gonna, I'm going to not come. And I'm going to see if, if, if people email and be like, hey, where was Chris this month? I think it might be one of the highest rated episodes um, ever. <laughs> and, you know, even, even on top of that. The sound that would be made of when the, for your emails dinging about where's Chris at would be like this. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that that's nice. Uh, that just hurt just a little bit. Yes, Chris, I'm just teasing. You're the, <laughs> you're, the you're the glue that keeps us all together, man. I love you. Yeah. <laughs> so, what do we have going on besides endless amounts of our deep seated hatred for each other that turns into love? Our courses, Dublin coming up May. Dublin, Ireland. If you're not going, get on the site now. Get your ticket. Go. It's going to be an awesome course. We did one there last year, and where we chose is one of the best locations we had for engagements. Awesome location there in Dublin. That's May. Uh, Black Hat, we're 35% full. And Dave, I believe you have a class at Black Hat too, right? You have two classes, two two two-day classes? Yeah, both sold out. Are you kidding? I'm just kidding. Oh, man. (laughs) (laughs) Both have plenty of availability, actually. Anyway, <laughs> wow, that really stunk. I was like, no, come on, no. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I know it hurt you just a little bit, Chris. It did. Like, you're just like, you're like, really? It hurt me. I mean, we always compete, kind of, you know. And I was like, man, that already. I thought the only people that were sold out were like Offsec. Like, no one beats Offsec. It's just the, it's just the end of it. Those guys are sold out like the day it opens. It's pathetic. So we got that going on, and then also Baltimore, which is in November. So uh, Baltimore, Maryland, right in the Inner Harbor, beautiful location in November. Should still be great weather, and uh, looking forward to that. So those are our three public classes, the last three chances you have this year for the Advanced Practical Social Engineering course. Um, we also got the DEF CON competitions. I, this year, the SECTF is tag teams. So how that's going to work, I can't tell you yet. We'll talk about it next month. But get ready. Even the sign-up process has been changed this year. Everything is new and improved. It's going to be awesome. It really is going to be our best year yet. Um, and, of course, we got the uh, SECTF for kids. Um, the, they're going to be solving a crime this year. So another great. That's awesome. Yeah, one of these, one of these years I'm going to bring my, my kid uh, to Vegas. Maybe I can even arrange it this year to bring Gavin because he's old enough now. I mean, he's, Dude, that'd he's be awesome. 26. Man, that'd be, that'd be sweet. That would be great. And talking of your kids and your family, we are going to DerbyCon this year. Yeah! I just had the um, – so I was great. I, um, your, your wife pinged me last night. We were talking about some other stuff. and What pinged you yet last night? That didn't sound right. 
Yeah, yes, yeah, that didn't sound right. Sorry, it was a conversation. It was okay. Everything was safe. It was good. Yeah, yeah. But okay. she was. She she said, "Hey, you coming to Durban?" I said, "Of course." Yeah, Dave and I already made all the plans. We got a training. We're giving speeches. Michelle's speaking. Everything's good. And she goes, "Really?" And I went, "Um, I meant, can Thanks, I do Chris. this?" Thanks, Chris, I slept. I slept on the couch um, <laughs> last night, so I just want to thank you for I, that. I did. I thought. I just assumed you told the boss. So she said, "Can you please?" Well, listen, when we make transactions and stuff like that, I'm usually traveling and stuff that I forget about, and then you know when it becomes relevant, I do it. You know. <laughs> So I said, I, she, I said, can you please go on the website and fill out the well, – I did. Went on last night and put our course in officially and did all of that. So now we're we official. Rejected it. We and rejected and it. I, got I got the rejection email this morning. Sorry, you're not worthy of coming to Derby. Thanks for the – thanks for trying. <laughs> Try again next year. So – but we're excited about Derby, man. Because you guys got some big news, don't you, for Derby? Yes, we have some amazing news this is uh, basically a dream come true for me. It was like the first Derby Con where like we we finally put on a first conference, and I remember sitting at the party and uh, looking at the audience, and basically almost getting a little teary eyed because of like all the people that had come for just something that we had created and for the reasons why we had created it. And uh, it's almost like that type of moment for me for this. And uh, so this year we got uh, Infected Mushroom to uh, to play the the party this year, and they've been amazing, like just really cool and awesome and. Just a great bunch of group of people, and it's just like a, you know they're one of my fa they're they are my favorite band, you know, and, and having them there is like a huge honor. So I'm really looking forward to this year, um, and I really can't wait. When is that? When is the party? Uh, the party will be on Saturday, so Saturday night. Yeah, and I mean it's going to be hard to top uh, Crystal Method like they did last year. I mean, like, last year Crystal Method rocked the house so hard that the actual ceiling started to fall apart. And I'm joking, <laughs> um, you know. So you know it's going to be be difficult, but I know in fact they can do it, and uh, they're a great group, and we're really so excited about it. Man, that is going to be nuts. I am excited. We're talking that's September, right? People nice. can get tickets already for that. You can check out DerbyCon.com. 24th or 20th for DerbyCon. Okay. You too, the book. Man, it's it's amazing. I, I have, and, I, and I've read about half of it. Thank you. Yeah, the book came out, and I didn't know what to expect. It is completely different from my first book, and it is it is a different book, I think, for this industry than what's out there. I mean, focusing all on nonverbals and the response has been amazing. Amazon like, got sold out three times already. Um, so the sales are going really good and a lot of positive feedback. A lot of people are interacting with me more so than the first book like through email and Twitter. So it's been really, really great so far. And of course, having uh, Ekman's support. Last month, we had Paul Kelly on. He was the editor for the book. And that ended up being one of the most highly downloaded podcasts ever that we've had literally in the last, uh, that was so that was 55 and 55 months um, which kind of brings us to the topic of that last month I said that Dr. Eckman was coming on this month and he had got called into some meetings, some travel, he's doing some new research, which we will talk about next month when he's on. Um, so this month he had to reschedule uh, and the time that he could reschedule put, it, uh, put us into the next month time frame. So uh, this month we have a really exciting guest actually. Um, Michelle and Mika and I were out at RSA. Sorry, Dave, no comments. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and we were waiting in uh, the lobby. And uh, like RSA does, they have some entertainment sometimes. And this guy came up. His name was Calvin. He was um, like a street magician. And, um, and he did this thing that I can only call as one of the best examples of live cold reading that I ever saw. He, what he did is he made uh, Mika write the name of a friend – and in a piece of paper that was inside of a, a billfold that then got rubber band and placed inside of a backpack and zippered. And he never saw it. I mean, I really watched the guy. There was no way. It was never opened. He never saw it. And then he guessed the name of this friend with 100% accuracy. And it was amazing. So afterwards, I went up to him and I said, hey, here's my card. I'd love to get you on the podcast because, of course, uh, here you got a massive crowd. You're influencing people. You know, you're doing sleight of hand tricks. You're doing all sorts of things, and you really got to be good at this in order to do it in front of this much of a crowd. So I'd love to have you on. So he, we contacted back and forth through email, and his name is Calvin. We're going to get him on the show now and then discuss uh, a little bit about what he does and, and how that can uh, help us as social engineers. I'm actually really excited about this one. I think it's going to be really interesting to kind of talk about how you can basically look at somebody's reaction or get enough information. I mean, it's exactly what we do on a daily basis. So... This is going to be a fun one for me. Yep. Let's get him on. Calvin Kaiku, nice to have you with us today. Thank you so much for having me. 
Not a problem. So I tried to just give the story before you came on a little bit about how we met you over in San Francisco, but I think you would do a better job telling us what is it exactly that you do? I'm a magician and I do uh, a full range of different kinds of magic, card magic, sleight of hand magic, uh, stage magic. And uh, the reason why uh, I guess you saw me uh, and uh, picked up on me was because I was doing a mentalism trick. Uh, and uh, the trick I was doing was actually a friend of Michelle's, I believe. The premise of the trick is a, a what's in a name. And everyone is born with a name. You're given a name at birth. Uh, some people ch- decide to change the name. Some people decide to keep their name. I chose to keep my name for my whole life. I feel like a, a person's personality is shaped based off of this person's name. So what I did was uh, I had someone think of a, a friend, a best friend, someone who they knew really well. And I had them describe certain aspects of their personality, their interests, what they liked uh, of uh, a movie or, or a favorite color or or a bunch of different questions based on their personality. And I was only able to derive a a uh, a name from from that personality without that person telling me anything about their name, just their personality, not even gender. Yeah, th- this is kind of like what was amazing. So I'm not if, – if I'm stepping over the line, of course, just tell me you can't answer these questions. But um, – for us, we're we're big into like nonverbal body language and facial expressions, and using that as security people and being able to read others. So, are you, when you're asking these questions, are you looking for particular nonverbal cues that tell you something about that individual? In this particular trick, I, and yes, there's there are there's some things that I will not be able to explain because of the, uh, of course, the uh, the great magician's code of not being able to reveal any of our secrets. In this particular trick, I I did not use any body language, but there is a lot of mentalism in which I do use body language. Right. So, uh, like, I was reading a book from a guy named Ian Rowland on cold reading, and he talks a lot about mentalism and people who, you know, use um, supposed psychic uh, powers as a job, and, and they... And they use cold reading a lot, you know, asking people questions and then looking for a reaction either in their face or their body and then going further with that. So um, did you take training in in how to do that or was that something that you just had naturally so you use that skill? I think for my practice involves a lot of self-training and a lot of uh, reading on the basically on the technique and then having to practice it in public. Through over the time of being a magician, I interacted with a ton of people to test out these techniques. You know, for in a very early part of the learning process, you know, I failed many times. You know, it's something that you have to be able to see more and more of the fine details of a person's reactions and just to get to know people's personality. I mean, everyone is different and you have to find the things that are the same in each person. You know, we all have eyes, we all have ears, nose, we, we're all human. And so we all have a common ground as far as being human. You have to find these links that you can uh, discover how each human can react the same to a certain catalyst, I guess that you, you can say, to almost make it seem like their reaction to is something that you give them is completely different from someone else's reaction, but, but it could possibly be the same. Uh, I would imagine that some of your work, either maybe not now because you appear to have transcended this portion, but do you do a lot of street magic? Watch walking down the street and doing some tricks for people or things like that, or have you done that in the past? I've done that in the past. That was actually one of the things I did early on in my career to practice a lot of new material. Street magic is really great for that. And I figured that, so I'm asking this question because that's probably the most similar experience to what we have to to deal with. So you're walking down the street and you're going to walk up to a group of people. How do you determine who your, I don't mean to use this term maliciously, but who your mark is? Target. Yeah, your target, your mark for this trick. <laughs> you know, I mean right. it maliciously. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's funny. Uh, before I used to think, you know, the magic comes first. After years of just constantly going up to random groups of people, I, I realized that magic is just more of the tool of interacting. And 
if I approach a group, the first thing I do is basically interact with everyone to get to know them, just to say hello to them. Uh, I explain who I am, obviously. Otherwise, they're just going to think I'm some random stranger trying to say hello. I tell them I'm a magician and I'm there to, to say hello to people. And then I ask people how they're doing and what they do, what the, kind of get to know them. Uh, and from there, I'm able to see who's more open, who's, uh, who's more forward, uh, who's able to interact with me better than the others. And from there, I'm able to distinguish who I'm, I'm going to say, okay, how about you? Uh, I have a, I have something I want to share with you. I, I have a deck of cards here. Why don't you choose a card for me? And from there, I'm able to then work the crowd. So it always starts with, yes, it does start with just one person who's more forward than the others. And what, what are the cues that you look for to determine that someone is maybe good to use as that target? Are there particular things that you look for? There's also a fine line of making sure that they're not too forward. Because if they're too forward and too controlling and trying to create the interaction to be all about them, then it you lose control of, of the situation. The things I do look for is is the ability to almost have that ping pong communication. I hit the ball to them. Uh, they're able to communicate and send the ball back and not just hold on to it as far as communication and interacting goes. And then when you walk up to a group, let's say, you know, like our group there, it was like three of us because uh, you chose Mika as the mark in your trick for us. So how, what was it about her that you said, OK, not Michelle, not me, not the other guy that was sitting next to us, but Mika was your target for that particular trick? Well, just going back to what I was saying, she seemed to be interacting with me more than Michelle and, and you, Chris. And it's not to say that just because you guys didn't interact with me doesn't mean that you guys could have been potential targets. It could have been that I could easily have interacted with Mika first and then gain some interest within you, Chris, and then have you become the target. So my in with the entire group, I feel like in a group is, is like an entire organism. It's not separate entities. They're all one big mass organism that you have to find the entry point. So, yeah, I, I did chose Mika just because she was the easiest to interact with and seem like she was willing to play along. But yes, I could have used other people that were there uh, based on the methods of easing my way from one person to the next. Because this is interesting, and this mirrors a lot of what we have to do, right? We'll walk into a building. Our job is to test security. We have to get past, uh, let's say, a group of security guards. And you have a couple seconds while you're walking up to eye up the group and see which person is going to be the person you approach. The wrong choice could really change the whole outcome of the engagement. So in your industry, is there a particular style of body language? or Because now even before the conversation, right? So before I get it, when you're talking, you definitely want to choose, choose the person who's a little more interactive with you. But are there things that even make you raise an eyebrow or say, say you know, yes, that's the person I'm going to try because of this? Yeah, the body language actually it is really important. Uh, it's one of the things I look for is mostly uh, is eye contact, really. Yeah, I was going to say, is it lack of eye contact? Is it more eye contact? What are you? If you had to articulate it, are you looking for somebody who's a little bit more aloof or not as present, or somebody who's more so? You have to find someone who's more so a present in the sense of having to uh, find someone who looks at you and and who with their face at you and their body facing towards you, it's not necessarily their entire body, but for the most part, their head turns towards you. You can see their entire That's, face. Their okay. eyes are looking directly at you. That is the kind of body language I'm actually looking for. We exactly. call that open body language. Why do you look for open body language? For lack of better words, a good opening for the group of people. It's almost like that is how they are sending back to me uh, information. They are, it's almost like if you're, you know, doing an internet connection, you try and connect to the other end. How do you know you're connected? It's by them sending a signal back to you. And that signal that they're sending back to you is their body or their, their open bodiness that they're giving back to you. From that moment, we create a connection. Right. So now I'm trying to picture this in, in you know, in your situation, because I think even in yours, it's probably a little more 
adversarial. Let's say like, you know, we walk into a building, people don't know that we're not supposed to be there. You know, if we do our job right, they assume that we are. So that's all good. Now you, you come into a group and everyone knows that you're not part of the group, that you're there to do a trick, that you're there to try to fool us. So you have those guys like me watching everything you do, trying to see if I can pick up how you guess that name. For Mika, right? Right. But that's why you want open body language because otherwise, if you choose somebody who has closed body language, the group might reject you and then that person with open body language isn't necessarily gonna go, wait, let's give this guy a shot. But once one person in the group with the open body language who's more receptive target or mark opens up to you, which you know through open body language is more likely, then the rest of the group will likely open up unless you get a real aggro guy who's like, no, get out of here. But then the social pressure, it was working against him the whole time. But but the, still the hard part I would imagine is like in our group, you chose Mika and that was the right choice. She definitely has a lot more open body language and facial expressions than both Michelle and I who are more guarded. So that was a really great read on that. And you did pick the best target out of our group to do that trick with. That was that was the best. But now here I am, I'm sitting on the sidelines and I was very interested. I wasn't closed to you being there, but I was gonna catch you. I was gonna figure it out. That was my perception, which of course I didn't. But that's all I was watching for. I didn't care about the trick. I was looking for, okay, did he look in the book? Is there some kind of technology? Is he using cold reading? Like what what is it? And I was sitting there the whole time just analyzing the situation, trying to figure it out. So I imagine that happens to you a lot. How do you control that environment, you know, so you don't get caught? You know, your trick isn't isn't released and someone's like, oh, yeah, I know how you did that. First off, you, you just got to be good. You have to know all your angles. You have to know all of every ins and outs of the trick. Each trick has a lot of work that is put into it, a lot of great thinking. One of my favorite lines in that recent movie, uh, Now You See Me, is, is as a magician, you want to be the smartest one in the room. You want to be able to know everything that the other person is thinking. As a magician myself, sometimes I go and see magic shows and I am that guy. I was you, Chris, many <laughs> times going to magic shows going, I'm not even going to pay attention to the presentation. I'm just trying to figure out how they're doing this. And from that point of view, I'm able to think like you, Chris, and be able to create a presentation that could potentially mask what I'm doing. So it's allowing me to first put myself into your shoes, into your eyes, and into in your mind, and be able to create a presentation that twists everything that you're thinking, and be able to present something that makes it look magical. That's just the process as a magician. You need to be able to look at all different angles and, and create a, a presentation that is both appealing and be able to hold all the secrets without revealing it. Now, see, has that become more challenging, I guess, with, with larger groups of people uh, versus like, you know, working with just a few folks? The beautiful thing about working in a large group is that it, when you do present a magic trick for, just say like you pull someone up on, onto the stage and you, you present a trick that fools them and their reaction, their reaction amplifies the trick so much more mm -hmm. that the people who are skeptical in the audience the ones who, every single person who you think is uh, going to be skeptical, the reaction yeah. of the person who's on stage, it, it just amplifies so much more of the trick that then the people who are skeptical now believe even more of what's going on. Huh. You know, as long as you can find that in with the group, like what I said, the, whether you're working with a small group or a big group, the whole group is an organism. And you have to work the edges that from the outside or from the inside to out, you have to find your entry point with the audience so you can have to gain not only their trust, but be able to control them as a whole. So you use social proof in that instance to get yeah. skeptical people. By the end of your trick, you could have stayed there for an hour and not gone on elsewhere, and I would have been amazed every time because I was just I totally fooled and had no clue at all how it was done. As a matter of fact, what we talked about for like an hour after you left was all the possibilities. <laughs> <laughs> you, you made a statement when you were describing how you, you try to get your in in the group and you said that it's important that you try to control the environment. Now, that's really interesting uh, to me particularly because that is something that we talk about a lot in our industry, um, trying to control the environment of where we're, we're getting into. 
any tips you can give us in that? Like, how is it that you go about controlling your environment? First step to controlling an environment really is, is just to not really give away what you're doing. Even if they know that you're going to do a magic trick, you have to really set it up. Like, you have to keep the group always guessing at what you're going to be doing next. You know, they, they don't even know that I'm going to do a card trick or they don't even know I'm going to do a mentalism trick. They don't even know I'm going to do a visual illusion trick. You know, like what you're saying with what you do, maybe let's just talk about a security wise. Like you walk into a building and no one really knows what you're there for. Yeah. What you said there, you know, they don't know what you're doing. That's exactly how I control the group. I make it so that they don't really know where they're going. I'm essentially having everyone blindfolded and I'm guiding them slowly by slowly through this, through this tunnel. Uh, and, and they, ha they can only see so much. And, but what, what they see though is an amazing magical visual mental experience that they can have through this experience that I'm giving them. And that's how I control the, yeah, the environment. This is amazing because um, why I'm saying amazing is it's kind of like how similar our industries are, even though we're really, really uh, far apart. Yeah. But you're in essence saying that you control the amount and type of information that's released to the group. So, again, I'm thinking back. You walked up to us and you actually said that you were going to perform a magic trick and that you were going to pull a name out of Mika's head and she was going to think it and you were going to guess it. And then the prop was the book. So I want you to write the name in the book so that way you can't change it at the end. And we all know. And then we're going to rubber band the book and we're going to lock the book inside of a zipped container. So that way there's no way you can accuse me of cheating and no way Mika could have cheated and changed the name. So now everyone right. knows the, the basis standpoint of the joke of the, of the trick. But the, the best part is, is that you gave us what felt like a lot of information, but really analyzing it, there was no information in that whatsoever. Just that mm -hmm. you're there exactly. and you're going to guess a name. But we feel good because exactly. you told us what, what felt yeah. like a ton. And now you go through the whole process and still we can't – we have no clue how the heck you did it. That goes back to that whole uh, setting up a situation that fulfills the minds of the skeptics. Like what you were saying with you were just sitting there just to – figure it out. You know, I was that same guy. So I, I'm using that knowledge. I'm able to throw out all this information, right? Throw out all this information that you're thinking about and prove that this is legitimate. I was convinced that you were using nonverbal body language as a cold reader. I, I was convinced of this. I even I mouthed it to Michelle. <laughs> but then every time you made a guess, you turned and you eye blocked. So you put your hands over your eyes like you were straining to guess the name. And I'm like, but wait, if he's not looking at her face or body, how is he using body language when he's guessing the bloody name? And I, and I couldn't get it. I couldn't, I couldn't. So I'm like, wait, hang on. It's not nonverbal. Now I'm trying to go, okay, what is it? You know, and there was no one standing behind Mika, like looking over the paper, mouthing it to you. I'm like, okay, I don't know how this, how this works. So that. So Calvin, what you're really talking about, though, is like being able to manage people's expectations. I mean, control of the environment in the respect that, you are guiding people to think a certain way and to expect certain things and to even be looking for certain things as well. Yeah, it's essentially influence. I'm influencing a crowd, essentially, to think a certain way. It's absolutely yeah, true. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, that, that's a great statement, Michelle. Right? So managing the group's expectations. I love that. Because you really have to do that well. Yeah, and you did. You told us exactly what was enough for us to feel like we're going to take this book, we're going to rubber band it, we're going to and you told us why so no one can cheat. And the whole time you probably were cheating, but we had no clue about it because you told us you weren't gonna and we just followed it. And I thought what an epic example of crowd control. It wasn't just the four of us, right? I mean, there was you know, 10,000 people in the hallway, but you know, you you were surrounded by people over in the lines or, uh, across from us, people behind us next to us. So you had maybe 20, 30, 40, 50, 100 people that can clearly see you doing this trick in plain sight. So that's actually lead that to a question. Do you have to worry about that? Like, do you, when you pick your venues, because you were in a wide open hallway, so there was no lighting or something where you could have hid some piece of tech or something that would have led to this. So does that matter though? Every gig that I do, I think about the environment. I think about what, even audio wise, how people are able to hear me. My preparation before a gig is 
thinking about what the environment is going to be like. And I actually set up a number of tricks that I'll be performing that day. You know, just like at the RSA conference, I was thinking about how many people are going to be there, what the proximity of people are going to be, what that's going to be like. And I have a whole bunch of tricks that are catered to the situation. What I was doing at RSA might not work if I were to do uh, that at like New Year's events at a bar. Something like that, I would, you know, there's less talking. It's more visual that I would have to perform. So, yeah, I, I do think about all that. Yeah, that's know, really interesting, and, too. And that matches our industry in the same that we have to think of our pretext. So our pretext would be like, how am I going to get into this building? And it may change based on the type of business, the, the location, how many people are at the front desk. It may change based on all of, all of that information may change our pretext every time we approach a, a building. It may not be the same. Did you actually get hired by RSA or did you just show up and pretend you were supposed to be there? <laughs> uh, uh, that would have been great if I did, didn't I? Yeah, just like at the end, like, yo, I need a check. I didn't get paid. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just go up to the RSA supervisor the, and say, oh, yeah, I'm ready to get my check now. Yeah. And <laughs> that would have been the greatest trick of all. Like, you know? <laughs> yeah, they're like, you're not on the list, but you've been in the lobby all day performing, so it must be our mistake. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's not my name right there. You should change the name on the check. Actually, that's directly to me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was, like, I think, my third year doing the RSA conference uh, for that particular uh, uh, idea of performing for people as they wait in line for the keynote speaker. So what about not just skeptics, but haters? You know, people who, like, really don't believe. They really... They're not just there being skeptical. Like I was skeptical and trying to figure you out, but you may get those guys who really just, they want to prove you wrong. They want to embarrass you. You got to have those guys there too. How do you deal with, with them? I learned this early on when I was performing magic in high school. <laughs> yeah, would you just get beat up if they don't like it instead of just heckled? You know, I was that kid who was not necessarily like picked on all the time, but I was, I'm a small guy. So I was always working on new things and I've always wanted to practice them. So I would bring it to school and I perform for all my friends. But then there are always those guys who like, I know what he did. I know what he did. He, he did this, this and that. And like, and then I would prove them wrong by saying, Oh, this isn't, that's not how I do it. Even if they guess it correctly, <laughs> the reason is actually, no, there's this, there is this other aspect that makes it, I, I change it up and they go, Oh no, but then you did this. So it's basically it's argument that I have full control of because it's whatever they say, they can't validate. They can't entirely validate. Even if they get it right, if they said something like this, it was a gimmicked deck and I would pull out a different deck and I would say, no, go ahead, take a look at the card. Oh, that you know, is and epic. It's basically you have full control of what's going on even after you perform the trick. You have to be able to have that sort of out to be able to, to perform magic for people who are going to dissect you. Wow. So you got to plan for success, plan for failure, and plan for people who want to prove you wrong. Well, and that Absolutely. makes sense too from, you know, from a social engineering engagement perspective. It's just kind of controlling. You're, you're going to have full knowledge of the information, of the picture. You know, you're the only one that actually knows what's going on. So similar to Calvin, you have the ability to just control information, control the environment, and control what they see and what they perceive as well. And it works that way. There are times where we're infiltrating a building and we get caught. And a lot of times, and we've had this, where people will come to our classes that do this stuff for a living, and they say one of the most valuable things they learned is sticking with the story. And you get caught, and a lot of times people will get afraid because they get caught, oh, I'm part of a pen test. And we tell them, don't do that. Stick to your – how can they prove that you're not part of the pest control company or you're not part of the, the inspection company, whatever it is? They can't prove that. Not enough time for you not to get out of there. So just stick to your story. Just get all indignant and be like, listen, man, I'm just trying to do my job and go home. I hate this. I'm, trying, I'm tired. Yeah. Why are you going to run me through this crap? And then they're like, oh, I'm sorry, man. Yeah. The people who are actually most passionate about this kind of work are the ones who are going to find a way out of it. You know, it, of course, you, there are going to be those people who, like what you're saying, they're going to just give up and just say, oh, you know, I'm, yeah, I'm part of this pen test. But I think that the greater part about this type of work is when you get into those situations 
and what you could do when you're on your toes and you have to figure out, wiggle your way out of the situation. It's something that you don't normally encounter and it kind of keeps the work exciting. You even surprise yourself sometimes of the of solutions to the matter. So I think this is how we push ourselves to the next level, uh, whether you're a magician or you're doing the work that you guys do. It's important to get yourself into those situations, to, to get nervous at times uh, and to not necessarily know exactly what to do because that's exactly how you get better. Yeah, I, I love that. You know, that's so important um, as a lesson, I think, regardless of your industry. So, you know, you said, so the guy guesses it right. Maybe he's sitting there. Maybe, you know, I, I was I was thinking, maybe I guessed it right. And you just totally played it. I'm like, yeah, that's not it. Here's another uh, opportunity to mislead me into another direction. <laughs> I'm like, that is Try great. again, <laughs> Peter Griffin. <laughs> right. It, it, whatever we say, whether we're right or wrong, you can just totally blow it apart and say it's not true. Uh, I love that. That, that's great. And, and who, how are we going to argue it, right? Unless I had the whole trick lined up and ready to perform right there to show you how it was done. How, how, how can anyone really prove that? Yeah. I mean, that would have been sweet, like a dance off, but for magic. Yeah. <laughs> we talked a little bit about pretexting, what we call pretexting in our, which is coming up with like a character that we'll use in our job, which I'm, I'm certain that you have to also for the different venues. Are there any particular principles that you use or ideas that you use when it comes to developing your pretext or your characters that you're going to use? I've done a lot of character work just in general because I, I did a lot of acting school and, and also uh, for work doing, doing different plays and productions and, and also I, I did a lot of studying. I am also a, a professional circus performer as a clown. Uh, what? And, and you know, every time when people think clown, they think, you know, the, the big curly hair, the big makeup. But no matter what I do, whether I'm performing magic, you know, elegant magician, if, if even if, let's just say for that example, I actually still out use elements of clown in my work and people don't even know it. They laugh or they just think, oh, he's a funny magician. But at the same time, I'm, I'm actually using clown techniques. There's these character work of trying to essentially find the humanness of a character, it, whether this person is, he walks funny, or he's got an Irish accent, <laughs> or French guy, uh, he likes to perform the magic for people. Uh, you know, it, he's, it's all these different people, different uh, guys who, who are normal people uh, performing magic. And I think if you present yourself as a normal person, just another human, it makes the illusions, the tricks, that much more amazing. Huh. Imagine if Superman walks in and he's like, oh, yeah, I could see through that wall. And you're going to be like, oh, yeah, obviously, that's Superman. <laughs> but if it's a human, this regular guy, but you're one of your friends going, I can see through that wall. Let me tell you exactly what's through that wall. You're like, what? You could do what? That's, that's amazing. That's the kind of character work that you need to be able to do, no matter what kind of person that you are. You have to be human. You have to be normal. So the, the principle that you're applying is the simpler, the better. Absolutely. Yeah. You, you, uh, you underplay and then you over deliver. That's <laughs> underplay and uh, under promise and over deliver. That's, that's a great one. That's a common one for a lot of different industries, actually. <laughs> it is. Um, a lot of times uh, the people who listen to our podcast are avid readers also. So we like to ask like the people that come on the show if they have any particular books that they could recommend that that help them out or things that especially with the topics that we're talking about not necessarily about like, how do you do your tricks but the, the, any books that you used in training yourself to be like this uh, you know it's kind of hard to because a lot of the books that i read are all books that magicians would get it's basically you know they're all the secrets that are in these books and i I don't know if I can give away that. So, <laughs> now, what uh, you just did is you just enticed every one of our listeners. They're going to be yeah. like, what the heck? Get the name of the book. <laughs> Full list of books over at theartofcharm.com. Right. <laughs> um, well, I guess I won't, I won't force it out of you. That's where I did the other version of not over-deliver, but under-deliver. <laughs> <laughs> Over-promised and under-delivered. <laughs> I exactly. have the best library on the planet Earth. It is amazing. If I if I were to show you my library, you would learn everything under the sun that you need to know. But I'm oh, sorry, I can't tell you one book name. 
you know, I know people like to read a lot, and but there was something that um, one of my teachers told me uh, actually when I was in college, and this was in regards to clowning. Actually, I believe this in all of performing um, and also social interaction. You can't really learn this type of work through books. You have to practice it in real life you're not going to get the same experience. As much as you read something, you're just going to be thinking about it and mentally and not actually exercising it physically. For all of the avid readers out there, put the book down and go hang out with people and, and test out these techniques. That's the only, I would say, as far as like book-wise for this type of work. I mean, you can certainly find techniques of social interaction. There is a book called As We Speak, how to Make Your Point and Have It Stick by Peter Myers and Shan Nix. It's, it helps with overcoming your fear, fear of public speaking. It's actually what people, consultants use for the companies when, they, when they're hired to talk to a CEO to help them give a keynote. That's actually a great book suggestion and perfect for our industry. Another very close similarity to our two industries is how you can read, and we do. We have a lot of books that we promote, but you're never going to be great at this job until you put the book down and go out and just have a conversation with people and learn about them. And that's what's going to make you great at this. So that's another very valid point. And how about this, Calvin? Um, do you have any sort of personal heroes or people that you look up to in your industry, Some somebody that you try to emulate? You know, there's actually a lot of, you know, my colleagues, all of my colleagues that I, I work with. I mean, I'll name my, my teacher as well, who is actually not a magic teacher, but he's, he's my clown director. And actually now I work for him through an organization called the Medical Clown Project, which we go into different hospitals and perform for uh, patients. Uh, his name is Jeff Raz. He's the artistic director of the, uh, of the organization, a great, great organization. And that's someone who I look up to as far as being able to learn a whole lot about interacting with people and Business-wise, it's really important for that kind of communication as well. Performing-wise, as far as magic goes, I really enjoyed when early on David Copperfield, not necessarily for his magic, but for his storylines that he create. that it was almost like you didn't even remember what magic or the illusion that, that had occurred. It was more of the feeling, the emotion, the storyline that he created. And that's one of the things I try and do within my magic as well. The colleagues I work with now, as far as magic goes, a really great magician who's very prominent in the Bay Area and around the country. His name is Jay Alexander. He does a lot of good work. He was also at the RSA conference. Uh, another friend of mine, Jade, who was the first, I think, female to win gold at the International Brotherhood of Magicians. Really great uh, magician as well. And also, not only with magic, but with other aspects of performing, I to look at all of my friends who I studied with as far as clowning and theater goes. Just we, I just like to look at what they're doing and kind of get inspired by any work that they're doing. And I try and do the same. I just try and think that we all are elevating each other one step at a time. Thank you. Yeah. Well, it's funny. Uh, I, can, I can totally relate to the David Copperfield thing. I remember seeing him as a little kid. I can still, to this day, remember you know the stories that he did as part of the act, which you know was kind of a shock and awe for me. And I recently just saw him in Vegas. You know, it really is about the story, the full, complete part of the magic. You know, it's kind of like an interesting way of, of kind of telling the story and doing magic at the same time, which makes you remember it more than just you know a, a quick trick that you know, someone throws out there or does something. So I, I can respect that totally. Mm -hmm. I was going to say, have you ever used your magic for nefarious purposes? Like, you know, so long ago that any statute of limitations would have passed by now. In other words, like when you were little, were you like, oh, sleight of hand, I'm going to take candy bars now or whatever, or worse, ideally. Oh, God. You're uh, getting into my, <laughs> to my bad side. I I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say this. Okay, there's a, uh, I can't claim this, but there was a technique used to cheat on some tests at school using certain things that magicians use to hide small pieces of paper. <laughs> yes, you had a friend that, that yeah. may have done that yeah. at some point yeah. in his life. Yeah. Yeah. And you don't condone it at all, ever. <laughs> no. I have similar stories yeah. for myself. <laughs> There's a few things that 
magicians like to do is to get into that situation. But once again, I am going to under deliver there. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I know, no fun, right? <laughs> to keep you guys guess. Otherwise, <laughs> otherwise you guys aren't going to want any more. As a parting gift, uh, can you give us like any clue on how you did that trick with Mika at, at RSA? Oh man, I don't know. I can't do that. I can't. Chris, yeah. it was it was magic, bro. Settle for it. It was actual magic. It wasn't. I'm gonna figure it out. <laughs> the great part about magic is that every person has their own solution and their own magical solution. It's almost like you're setting up a situation where you're influencing multiple thoughts with just one idea. So everyone's going to think something different. Some people will think the same things here and there, but but overall you're going to get a lot of different thoughts activated in, into your brain based on different people's upbringing of what they know and what they don't know. It's kind of cool, you know? Yeah. I like to hear a lot of what people think of how magic is done just because it's, well, A, it helps me improve upon that trick so that I could cover up anything that they may think. Uh, and, and B, it's just really cool to be able to influence people to think. Yeah, that is true, isn't it? I read something, uh, it wasn't recent, but a little bit ago about laughter and creating a, a happy environment, which is usually very odd to see inside of a hospital. But when people can do that, healing actually is quicker. People can heal from things where they thought maybe they wouldn't ever heal. Uh, when they feel better and happiness, laughter, jokes, those kind of things can make people feel better and it has a drastic effect on that. That's why they started doing things like putting small animals in nursing homes, right? So the older folks get to pet a cat or a small dog or something and it, it has a psychological effect on them that makes them feel happier and it can actually improve their health. So I would imagine the work you get to do at the hospital is probably quite rewarding when you see people laughing and happy and enjoying the, the tricks or the jokes or the things that you do, and then and maybe it has an effect on their health, too, in a good way. Absolutely. And what I was saying earlier, the, really the magic is about having a tool to interact. You know, the first thing that you want to do is be able to interact with the patients and be able to create a human-to-human -human interaction. That is not about oh, let me put an IV in you, or let me take your blood pressure, or let me take your temperature. Let, we're just there to hang out with the patient, and then we use yeah. magic or whatever we're performing. Sometimes we perform uh, music uh, for them as well, and we use those different tools to enhance the interaction. Yeah, and laughter does really help, but I think what's really happening is if you put your mind to something, even if it's about healing, you're going to heal. You're going to get better in, in, in certain situations. You're going to be able to heal a little bit faster if your body and your mind is willing to do it and if you're happy to do it. Yeah. You know, it, it's difficult to heal when you're just laying there and just in agony. And so the laughter creates the happiness of, oh, I could be happy. I don't have to be miserable here. I could feel good because this happened in front of me from these medical clowns. They, they came in and they helped me feel good. Oh, I now know that I'm capable of it. Why don't I try and feel good again on my own and on top of that, be able to heal even faster as a result? Yeah, interesting. It has to be rewarding. Calvin, some of the people here would like to know like how they can find out more about you. So do you have a website or a Twitter account or some things that you'd like to, to promote so people can look you up and, and see what you're doing? Sure, absolutely. Uh, my name is uh, Calvin Kaiku. My website's basically my name dot com. Calvin dot com. There's actually a Facebook like if you want uh, on the top right corner. So that's Calvin C A L V I N. K A I K U. Dot com. Com. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm going to be down in San Diego for four months performing for the SeaWorld Circus show called Cirque de la Mer. And uh, I'll be the clown in that show. But I will wow. be performing um, comedy as well as maybe some magic in the, in the middle of it. So I'll be down in San Diego for four months. San Diego is a beautiful place. And your website is nice. I'm glad you had that redone. It's easy to get around and navigate, so we'll point people to that. And I imagine uh, if companies or other people listening like to call you, you're for hire for these certain things too, 
and they can contact you there through your through your website. Yeah, absolutely. I kind of get amazed when we talk to people from different industries and then they start telling us the skill sets that they use and how we can find these matching skills in our industry. And for me, how interesting that is. So I really appreciate you coming on the show today. I'm really glad you walked up to our small group and got in and were able to do that trick. I'm actually really happy that I didn't figure it out and still now months later um, have me guessing at what the heck it was that you did. That's a nice experience. So you're obviously doing well with that. And uh, I'm sure this will be interesting for all of our listeners. I just want to thank you a lot for that. Yeah, well, thank you so much for having me. And I, it's good to be able to correlate between the different genres of work. Sure is. We'll talk soon. All right. Take care, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Another epic podcast. I was actually shocked at how similar our industries are, personally. About anything that we forgot? You want me to I tell the story, I, don't you? I think... I think it's a good story. <sighs> okay, well, this has to do with, you know, Calvin's hero, one of Calvin's heroes being David Copperfield. And I have to admit that David Copperfield is also one of my heroes simply because when I was a tot, well, I guess high school counts as tot, I was hired to be his assistant on his show in Las Vegas and would have been traveling with him the summer he made the Statue of Liberty disappear. But my mother, in her wisdom, made me go to basic training in college instead. So that was the story that uh, never was. Thank you very much for I, making me tell that. Well, listen, I, personally, <laughs> I'm happy that you didn't go to be <laughs> David Copperfield's assistant because I would have never met you and I would never have you working with me. So that would be very sad. That's so, weird that Asian parents made their daughter go to basic training instead of being an assistant and famous. No, it was I'm all like, about school, man. Yeah, that checks sad, out. So. <laughs> Oh, boy, that would have been... Imagine this. We would have been watching TV some night, Jordan, and David would have been on, and there would have been Michelle standing Except next. we would just know her as David Copperfield's hot Asian assistant. True. Yeah, That's that all we, that we wouldn't know her, probably. Right, we wouldn't know her at all. Instead, now, you're the queen of social engineering. That's really sad. How far I have fallen. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah I don't know. Yeah. Instead, you're on this podcast. I think that, no, no, that hurts a lot a bit. It's not a little bit. That hurts a lot a bit. Come on, man. David Copperfield. David Copperfield, Chris Hennig. I, I, I don't know, man. Option B sounds better to me. You are traveling around the world in first class and stuff. It sucks. Yeah, sucks. And now here you are with me traveling in, in economy. Yeah. And going yeah. to conferences where thousands of sweaty guys are hugging you. It's, it, I, listen. I honestly can't see why you would ever want to yeah. not do this. You're welcome, is what you mean. <laughs> That's right. That's A life right. only dreamed, yes. Yeah. You're welcome. <laughs> we'll, we'll bore you next time with the details. Yes, we'll bore you Now next we bored time you with enough details. with Michelle's life story. Overpromised, underdelivered. Yes. Yes. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> We're just following Calvin's example. We're entering the month of April already, which just blows my mind that it's 2014 and we're already into. Yeah, we're 25% of the way done. <laughs> yeah, that's crazy. The year is flying by already, and we are just solid booked. Our courses are filling up. Our pen test schedule is filling up. Our private trainings are filling up. Um, it's It's been a great, great run so far, and things are just getting better. We added more people to our team, so we're growing. Our next event, Michelle, is Dublin, right? We're not going anywhere, no speeches or anything before then? No, uh, you're going to West Virginia, uh, you'll be back by the time this podcast is out. Oh, stop reminding me. But not public. That's a private training, so you can't you can't join that one. So until next time, folks, if you want to follow us, you have social-engineer.org or social-engineer.com. Our Twitter account is Human Hacker. Corporate Twitter is SOC Engineer Inc. If you're still into IRC, you can check us out on the irc.freenode.net network channel social-engineer. That's about it. So we'll talk to you guys next month. See ya. Yeah. Distant song 
But that hill keeps going on and on. My heart is gone. seem to recall any given name I see the footprints how they come how they go was that only a moment or many years ago my heart is gone 